For our last Lewis structure video, we've got two more ideas to talk about. The first is resonance, which is the situation where multiple structures could be drawn that would use up all of our atoms and use the right number of electrons. And sometimes those multiple structures will be, the, they'll be equivalent. In those cases, we use resonance structures. In other cases, you might be able to arrange the atoms in a different way, and you might need to choose which is the best structure or which one contributes the most to the resonance. And in those cases, we're going to look at formal charge. That'll sort of give us an easy way to determine what the best structure is. So we'll start off with resonance structures. And it's really easier to understand, I think, if you just see, if we start off drawing some Lewis structures. So I'm going to jump on in. And the first molecule that we'll talk about is ozone. Ozone, as a compound, has three oxygen atoms. And they're all arranged in pretty much a line. Now, ozone has 18 available electrons. Each oxygen brings six. If I go ahead and put lone pairs around each oxygen so that everybody has eight, that uses 20 electrons, which is two more than we have. That means we've got to put a double bond in somewhere. Now, at first glance, it doesn't really seem like it matters if the double bond goes on the left or the right. But let's imagine, hypothetically, that instead of three identical oxygen atoms, our ozone has one special oxygen and two regular oxygens. Now our special oxygen might be um, one that's a radioactive isotope or something along those lines. That's how we practically determine these things. In this case, there's a difference between the structure that has a double bond between the central oxygen and my special oxygen, which would look like this with all of our lone pairs around. And the other way we could draw this has our special oxygen, and this time it's only going to have a single bond. So the two normal oxygens are on the opposite ends of our double bond. Now, these two structures, if our oxygens were all the same, would be the same structure. But since we've marked that one oxygen somehow, these are really different structures. And so even though we're going to draw our oxygens as all being identical, we need to include both of these structures. We usually do that by drawing out both of the structures and putting a double ended arrow in between them. That tells us that the actual true structure of, in this case, ozone, is somewhere in the middle of these two structures that we've drawn. Another way that we can um, communicate that same idea is instead of using solid double bonds, we can put in a dashed bond over both of our bonds. That tells us that each of those bonds is really like a bond and a half. So they're going to be shorter and stronger than single bonds, but longer and weaker than double bonds. Either of the two methods, so either drawing out both of the structures with the double-sided arrow or using the dashed lines is perfectly acceptable to indicate that you have a resonance structure. 
A similar resonance idea is at work in the structure of the carbonate anion. In this case, our carbon is going to bring four electrons, each oxygen is going to bring six, and the two minus charge adds two more electrons. That means we have a total of 24 electrons to distribute around our four atoms. The bonds themselves as single bonds are going to require six. And when we start putting lone pairs on, we have eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Two extra electrons means we need one double bond. So there are two ways, or there are three ways actually, that we can arrange that double bond. And just like with the oxygen, there's a couple ways that we can draw our final structure to indicate that we have that resonance. Um, I'm going to put an X through that because it's not the correct structure. Now, for our resonance structures, if we were going to draw them out with explicit double bonds, and I'm going to skip drawing the lone pairs at this point. Um, just to save a little time and space, but our structures would all look like this. So we're going to have one double bond between the carbon and one of the oxygens, and single bonds between the others. And again, we could look at this if we could mark one of our oxygens, we could see, you know, whether it has the double bond or not. And we would actually find that the true structure of carbonate isn't really any one of these. Instead, we have that same sort of hybrid structure where each of the bonds is not exactly a single bond, but not exactly a double bond. And in this case, it's more like, I guess, a bond in a third than a bond in a half, but it's the same idea. The bonds in this structure are somewhere in between single bonds and double bonds. Sometimes we have structures that look like they might be equivalent, but the atoms are arranged in slightly different ways. In those cases, the formal charge is really helpful to determine how the atoms are most likely arranged. So again, I'm gonna sort of jump in and start working some problems for you. The first molecule that I would, or ion that I would like to talk about is nitrite. Now, nitrite has one nitrogen and two oxygen atoms. So I'll go ahead and put the nitrogen in the middle. It has a one minus charge, which means that it has a total of one plus five plus 12, 18 electrons. Now, I know that that means I have a double bond on one side, which also means that I have resonance, but for now, we'll just worry about this. We'll just worry about the one structure. Now, when we are assigning formal charges to atoms in a molecule, there's a formula that we're gonna use that basically says formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons minus any non-bonded, let's call those electrons, non-bonded electrons plus the number of bonds. So basically what we're doing is every bond we're separating into its 
um, we're separating the, the electrons there. So if you think of this structure as really being oxygen, and then you've got a double bond that is four electrons, and then nitrogen, and then your single bond, and then the last oxygen, we're basically saying that these electrons belong to that oxygen and these electrons belong to that nitrogen and then those electrons belong to that oxygen. So it's a little bit different than counting up the valence electrons because we're pretending that no electrons are being shared. Now, when we count up our formal charges, each of our oxygens is going to start off with six valence electrons. The oxygen here on the left has one, two, three, four non-bonded electrons and two bonds. So the formal charge on that oxygen would be six minus four plus two. That gives us zero. So that oxygen has a formal charge of zero. Great. The nitrogen is gonna work out roughly the same way. The nitrogen is gonna start with five electrons, valence electrons. It has two non-bonded electrons and three bonds, so it also has a formal charge of zero. Our last oxygen <clears throat> now is going to start off with our six valence electrons, but now we have six non-bonded electrons and the one bond. That gives us a formal charge of one minus. Notice that the sum of the formal charges is equal to the charge on the ion as a whole. Since our NO2 minus ion has a minus one charge, we have to have a minus charge somewhere in the formal charges that's not balanced out. Now, our goal in writing these structures is so that if we look at the absolute values of our formal charges, so just the number parts without worrying about the signs, we want their sum to be as low as possible. If we have a negative charge on the compound or ion that we're looking at, and it's just a minus one, then a total formal charge magnitude of one is the lowest that we could have. And so zero plus zero plus one gives us one. That's a good sign. If we were using the, the hybrid resonance structure with the dashed lines between the bonds, it's going to get complicated. Um, you could essentially have a formal charge of minus one half on each of the oxygens, but we're not really going to worry about that too much. For the most part, I will not ask you for formal charge of hybrid resonance structures. Now let's look at a situation where the formal charge might point us in the right direction as far as our skeletal structure is concerned. With a compound like N2O, our first response might be to arrange our atoms in such a way that nitrogens are on the outside and oxygen is in the center. Since usually symmetry is what we're going to be aiming for, that's a pretty good place to start. Now, N2O has 16 available valence electrons. Each nitrogen brings five, and the oxygen is six on top of that. If we put our electrons around N2O with all single bonds, we're going to use 
there's four already. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. That's four too many electrons. That means we're going to need either two double bonds or a triple bond somewhere around our structure. So we can draw that, we can draw both of those possibilities and go ahead and put our lone pairs. And then we can count up the number of electrons, I mean the formal charges on each of our atoms. Now, in the first structure on the left, the nitrogens are going to be the same because they each have two lone pairs and two bonds. And so nitrogen starts off with five valence electrons. There are four non-bonded electrons and two bonds. And so each of our nitrogens has a charge of minus one. The oxygen starts off with six and has no non-bonding electrons and four bonds. So our oxygen then has a charge, a formal charge of plus two. That's really not ideal. Um, remember that we always want the total magnitude of the formal charge to be as small as we can get it. And that has four total charge units. So that's probably not the right one structure. Now, for the structure on the right, we are going to have to do two calculations for the nitrogens because they are no longer the same. So our first nitrogen starts with five valence electrons, has six non-bonding electrons, and one bond. That gives us a charge of minus two. That's a lot to begin with. Our oxygen, just like in the other structure, is going to be a charge of plus two. And then our second nitrogen will be five minus two plus the three bonds, which is zero. That's still four total charge units, let's say, which is still not ideal. We really want those numbers to be lower. So I'm going to try it with my skeletal structure rearranged a little bit. This time, I'm going to put the two nitrogens next to each other with the oxygen at the end. Now, again, I'm going to need two double bonds or a single and a triple. And now there are three different ways that I can arrange these. Um, since there's a nitrogen and an oxygen on either end, putting the triple bond in either position is going to change things. So let's start off with our double bond arrangement. We'll add in all of our lone pairs. Then I'm going to draw the triple bond between the nitrogens, which will look like that. And then I'm going to draw the last structure with our triple bond going between the nitrogen and the oxygen. I'm not going to write out the math that I use to get each of the formal charges in this case, just because I'm running out of some space, but I will go ahead and write the, the formal charges. Now, nitrogen always starts with five valence electrons. So I'm going to take each nitrogen in turn. This first nitrogen on our double bonded structure starts with five, has four non-bonding, and 
two bonds, which gives a formal charge of minus one. The nitrogen in the center here is going to be plus one because there are no non-bonded electrons, but there are four bonds. In the structure where our nitrogens are triple bonded together, the nitrogen on the end has a formal charge of zero. It starts with five, subtract the two non-bonded electrons and the three bonds, and you get the zero. Now, the nitrogen in the center is still going to be plus one because it still has no non-bonded electrons and four bonds. In our final example, the nitrogen on the end starts with five minus six plus one is seven. So the nitrogen on the end here is minus two and our nitrogen in the center is still plus one. Our oxygen atom is going to start with six valence electrons. In the double bonded structure, it's going to have a formal charge of zero. That also makes sense because N2O is a neutral atom a molecule, and so the total formal charge has to be zero. In the structure that has a triple bond between the nitrogens, our oxygen now is going to have a formal charge of minus one, and in the structure with the triple bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen, we'll have a formal charge of plus one on our oxygen. So we know right away that the bottom structure that has the triple bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen can't be correct because the total formal charge is still four. So we can ignore that structure. Now, we have to make a decision between a double bonded structure and our triple bonded structure. And the only difference as far as formal charge is concerned is the location of the minus one formal charge. Fortunately, we have a rule. And the rule says that if you have to choose where your formal charge goes, the more electronegative atom will preferentially take the negative formal charge. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So oxygen wants those electrons more than nitrogen does. That means that in a structure where we have a negative charge on our oxygen, and zero on one of our nitrogens is going to be the preferred structure. So that tells us then that the structure in the red box is the correct structure for N2O. The last structure that I want to discuss is xenon tetrafluoride. I mentioned it in an earlier video as an example where you don't think there is a super octet in the beginning, but you find out that there is one. That was a spoiler. I'm sorry. Now, obviously, the structure of xenon tetrafluoride is going to have xenon in the center with fluorines all the way around. Xenon tetrafluoride is going to start off with eight valence electrons from the xenon and four fluorines with seven electrons each. So that's 28 plus eight. We have 36 electrons available. If I start distributing those electrons, like you would expect me to, I've used eight in the bonds, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. I've got to put the extra four electrons somewhere. Fluorine is a tiny little atom. 
there's no extra room on my fluorines, which means I'm going to have to put those four extra electrons on the xenon. Xenon is relatively low on the periodic table, and so it can happily take those extra two electrons. Now, we can prove, if you will, that that's correct by looking at the formal charge. Fluorine, and all four of our fluorines are the same, so I'm only going to do the calculation once, starts off with seven valence electrons. There are six non-bonding electrons and one bond, which give us a formal charge of zero for each of our fluorines. The xenon is going to start off with eight valence electrons. It's a noble gas, so that's where it's going to start. We can subtract our four non-bonding electrons and our four bonds. That also works out to be zero conveniently enough. And so that's how we sort of verify that this structure does in fact have that expanded octet on xenon.